The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning and welcome to our service on this, I believe it's the 13th, 12th, 13th Sunday of Pentecost. Um, This morning we welcome back Peter, um, well rested and a little bit less of him on the talk, but it's good to have him back with us. Uh, you can follow along in your service and beginning with the Collect for Purity on page 185. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for this Sunday, author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion, nourish us in all goodness, and of your great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. 
hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God, forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. It is great to be back here at St. Mark's from my holidays, which were the same as other holidays, but different. We certainly live in times where things are the same, but different. It was the same because I got away to my mother's cottage where my family live in a separate cabin, but different because we could not see family in the same way we always had. We couldn't have any meals together or share food of any kind. We couldn't be inside together. We had to wash our hands, follow protocols. None of us a year ago would have predicted how this pandemic has played out. Even if we knew that a pandemic was coming, how it would affect our relationships with family, with friends. What I hope has not changed is our relationship with God. Jesus said in today's reading to Peter, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. That was Jesus' response to Peter whose world was suddenly changed when he heard and could not believe that Jesus must suffer, be killed, and on the third day be raised. Peter thought he knew better than Jesus. This must never happen, he said. We can't know the mind of Jesus, of God, in our own time. We don't know how present events surrounding COVID-19 will play out and what they will mean in the future. What we are called to do is to set our mind on divine things. Now, there have been many people throughout history who would like to know the mind of God and believe in doing so that they are setting their mind on divine things. We get a glimpse of the mind of God and Jesus. But to say that if we know Jesus, then we know the mind of God are two very different things. Even Jesus says that there are things he doesn't know about, but only God. One of those things was the end of the world. As Jesus states, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Matthew 24, 26. And yet, in these heady times, we hear 
and see people proclaiming that they know the end is near. One of my colleagues in Guelph posted on her Facebook page a picture of a sign on a hydro pole in Guelph which stated, Jesus is warning many. Time is now up. Sudden destruction coming. I went to the website listed on the sign, but they lost me on their first story that stated that the explosion in Beirut was caused by a nuclear bomb. What does Jesus mean by setting our mind on divine things? Well, the Greek word used for set in this verse means to seek after, strive for, be intent on. We have to actively seek after, strive, and be intent on divine things. There's no choice here because it doesn't automatically happen. We have to make the choice in our lives to be looking at divine things. If we ask what human things are, they usually have to do with violence as a solution, money as a goal, and fear as the way of life. Divine things would include salvation, love, justice, being with those who are going through a painful time. I was speaking with a parishioner recently who had heard something in one of my sermons about letting go. In this case, it was letting go of grief. She asked me to photocopy a copy of the eulogy, which she had been carrying around for decades for a loved one in her family. I remember it being one thing I did on a very busy day and asking myself if, if it could wait, but I thought, this is important. She told me after I gave it back to her that she had put it away in a frame, in a safe place, and that it had allowed her to let go of her grief. It was what mattered to her at the moment. We are called to weep with those who weep, which I think is part of a greater list of divine things, which I will get into later in my sermon. We've been thinking about the future, the near future of our ministry here at St. Mark's and how we are going to return to in-person worship of divine things and what it will look like. In two weeks, on Sunday, September 13th, we are tentatively planning, by permission of the bishop, to return to in-person worship at St. Mark's. Some things will be the same and some will be different than what happened before the pandemic. What will be the same? We will follow the same pattern of the more traditional communion service at 8.30 and the more contemporary communion service at 10, which will be recorded and posted on the internet later in the day. The Thursday service will begin on Thursday, September 17th at 10 a.m. But we may have to look at a new time for the Thursday morning Bible study. What would be different? We are only allowed 50 people in the church building at one time. There will be protocols that we've all gotten used to over the last few months. Masks will be worn, hands will be sanitized. There will be no books in the pews. There will be no singing by the congregation at the 10 a.m. service. There will be no coffee hour. There will be be communion, but it will be done differently. There will be no shaking of hands at the door or at the peace. I have to get creative about that. And if you need a cushion, we ask that you bring your own. We'll be sending out a poll in the next little while to find out what we as a church are thinking about regarding returning to in-person worship here at St. Mark's. Jesus asks us to live our lives with our focus on divine things. And certainly being away from the church, we've been able to do that. I pray that our relationship with God carries on through this difficult time. And coming back, that it will carry on in in-person worship too. Divine things include what we might think to be the impossible, the improbable 
COVID-19 pandemic certainly rates for those. And they are not within the realm of what we might think might happen without God. I end the sermon with the epistle, which we didn't hear today, from Romans, chapter 12, 9 to 18. That includes the call to weep with those who weep. And what might setting our minds on divine things would look like in full? Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with each other. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I will say amen to that.
I would invite you now to affirm your faith as we say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and will respond. The response to gracious God, hear our prayer, is, and in your love, answer. We pray for the world around us, for the many who continue to suffer and call out for help for those without enough to eat in third world countries and elsewhere, for those caught up in violence and political ups uprisings, for those picking up the pieces after a natural disaster, remembering especially those affected by the fires in British Columbia and California and the tropical storms, Laura and Marco, for those desperate to find work to support their families. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We also pray for family and friends who are suffering, those struggling physically or emotionally, those working to overcome mental illness, those facing challenges at home or at work. This week, we pray for Cynthia and Andy, Johanna, Brian, Bill, Lee, Michael, Deacon Jane Rokeby, Kay, Samantha, Daniel, Mandy, Sue, Tom, Jane, Gail, Linda, Julie, Janice, Jackie, Kay and family, Jessica, Robert, Keith, Jacob Blake, and for those grieving the death of a loved one. We pray for the recently deceased, the Reverend Canon Richard Rokeby. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. God, you have created us to pray for our adversaries, to bless rather than curse those who deliberately seek to harm us, those who have hurt us physically or emotionally. We ask you to bless them, open our hearts, so that we may see them as you see them, and to be able to respond to them with your love. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for your church around the world, that it will be a living demonstration of your coming kingdom, offering hospitality to all, ready to help in times of need, showing love to friends and adversaries alike, seeking to live in peace with all. We pray for Linda, our primate, and our Metropolitan Archbishop, 
and Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. God, we praise you for your faithful love and for the mercy you have shown towards us. Open our eyes in recognizing your presence in our lives. Give us grace to hear your call and courage to follow without hesitation, knowing that your way is the only way that leads to life. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. continue to give thanks for those who continue to support their church with their givings. Let us pray. Merciful God, receive all we offer you this day. Give us grace to love one another, that your love may be made perfect in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. And this morning, for the lion's tail, Tracy is going to be down in the Elizabeth room at the fireside interviewing Greg, our organist. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another fireside chat. Today, we welcome our music ministry coordinator, Greg Dickinson. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, let's get started, and we'll talk about uh, when did you start working here at St. Mark's as the Music Ministry Coordinator? Uh, I started fairly recently. It's only really been a year and a half. Um, I started last January, so just after the Christmas season of, I've already lost track, 2019, I guess. Yeah. The time's been a bit of a blur. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. 
Um, and before you came here, what other jobs did you have, or and what are you doing as well? Well, I'm, uh, in addition to this role, I'm, I'm a music teacher. I work with Peel District School Board, and uh, so I've been teaching music for Peel for this will be, I'm going into my 18th year, probably the most bizarre year, but this will be my 18th yeah. year of teaching with Peel uh, music, various different schools, and I've taught elementary and uh, secondary, and um, uh, currently I'm teaching at an art school, uh, Coffin Park Secondary School, uh, down in Mississauga. But uh, in terms of my music ministry work, prior to coming to St. Mark's, I worked at Christ Church Anglican in Bolton, uh, and I was there for 10 years, perhaps, and prior to Saint, uh, sorry, prior to Christ Church, I worked at Saint Albans in Nobleton, and I, that's where I started. And I was at Saint Albans for maybe, well, since I was 18 or 19 years old, I started that job. And at that time, I didn't even know how to play the organ, uh, but they didn't really care. They were so desperate for a music <laughs> director <laughs> that uh, they said, "Oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> just go for just your go, head. yeah, that's right." <laughs> Uh, so that's how I got started, and, and uh, I, I'd, be, I'd spent many years sort of looking for some answers, uh, and I thought uh, that the Bible and Christianity could help me with that, but each of the churches I'd sort of visited or spent some time at didn't really solve any problems, I didn't really feel at home, and when I started quite by accident working uh, for the Anglican Church when I was a teenager, uh, when I still had questions, uh, I can't say that the questions were answered right away, but I felt immediately a sense of, oh, this is where I belong. Yes, this makes sense. This is, this suits my personality and my nature, and uh, these people are so kind and loving, and, and so that made everything else a lot easier. Oh, that's great. Well, we're very glad you're here now with us. So am I. That said, what do you like best about being a part of St. Mark's? Well, one of the things that I was really drawn to at the very beginning. Uh, and, and for years living in Orangeville, I, I kept saying, I'm gonna drop off my resume there and, and let them know that I'm available as a, as a supply uh, a musician if they, if they needed one one Sunday that I would uh, be able to do that. But I had a lot of friends that um, belonged to this congregation and, and I'd heard so many good things about the warm people and the good work that uh, this church does in the community. And um, so prior to applying for this job, I already had this sense that this was a good place to be. Uh, the people are very warm, very welcoming. I've uh, been very supported. Uh, people are very kind about telling me what they've enjoyed. They are kind about telling me what they haven't enjoyed. And so the, the, the feedback has been constructive and, um, and uh, I, I have personally felt uh, that bringing my family into this community has been a safe and, and a wise choice as well. Um, so my daughter sings uh, with the choir and my boys attend the lion's den um, and they really enjoy being here and that's sort of good for me. That's great, I'm glad to hear that. Now, obviously music is an integral part of our worship service at St. Mark's and you are looking after what kinds of things is the music ministry coordinator? Well, the ministry, music ministry coordinator, uh, the most obvious jobs are uh, wrangling the choir. That's right, <laughs> I said wrangling. Um, uh, rehearsing the choir, uh, not just for the regular Sunday uh, hymns that people know and are accustomed to. We might fine tune a few things here and there, but also working on new anthems and uh, choral pieces that uh, might be a bit more challenging. Um, looking at the hymn selection each week, looking at the liturgy, figuring out what might match the, the tone or the message of the, the given services. Um, moving onwards and under normal circumstances, uh, the music ministry coordinator would also be responsible for bringing in uh, uh, guests, special guests, uh, concert series, facilitate, facilitating that kind of work. Uh, we haven't I personally haven't gotten to that stage where I've been able to do that, and that probably would have been happening now for this coming year. I think we're all on a little bit of a hold, but I look forward to branching out the role of the music ministry coordinator. Um, things like if uh, if we wanted to put together a children's choir, uh, mm -hmm. that happens through, uh, and, and it already exists uh, to an extent, but that kind of happens under the umbrella of the music ministry as well, and making sure that... Um, that uh, there's appropriate music being selected, and, and uh, Kathy and Shirley do such a great job of that that I haven't really had to worry about that role too much. So 
that's that's where we're at right now. Oh, that's great. I look forward to uh, continuing that that tradition with the children's music with Shirley and Kathy and, and uh, all of the Lions. And, and we love our music program uh, with the kids and look forward to continuing that and, and expanding, you know, what, what you're able to do once the pandemic is under control. Yeah. Um, and with all of the music selections that you have to make, you, over the years you must have a few perennial favorites in terms of hymns that you particularly like. Would you like to share a couple of those? Oh, absolutely. I So there's the hymns I like to choose because I know people like them and I like them as well. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear a lot of those throughout the services. If there's a repeat of hymns a few times a year, you'll know it's one that I like. And I <laughs> tend not to choose or select hymns that I don't like. Uh, even if people in the congregation do, I tend to avoid them unless someone specifically asks me to include that. Um, but there are a few hymns that are my own personal, yeah. um, something that gives me the shivers or something that just moves me emotionally. And you'll hear one. Um, at the end of the service. So if you're listening to the postlude, uh, I'll include that, as, but it's Jerusalem, which is uh, a lovely uh, piece of music, beautifully composed, gorgeous, sumptuous chords, and the words to me just really speak to my heart. It's not for everybody. I have to, I recognize that, that it does have, it's this contentious hint, but uh, when you listen to the music um, just after this interview, I think you'll, you'll recognize it as being a beautiful piece. I will make sure I am attentive to that, and I, I must say that the whole team has done such a great job with performing and, and you know, managing under the circumstances that you're all to be commended for what you've been doing with the whole choir. Um, now, moving on to prose and the Bible, um, what's one of your favorite Bible stories? You know, the one that speaks to me the most, and I really wish I could put my finger on the reason why, but this... The story of the prodigal son, the return of the that 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 story that the child has erred in so many ways, so much so that his own brother has released himself from the relationship. He is so uh, disappointed and uh, offended, but he's made his life choices, and when the the son has run out of money and run out of resources and realizes that nobody in the world really cares for him and uh, he comes home and the father produces this wonderful feast and welcomes him with open arms back into the family and the other son says how could you do this he's completely squandered your your money he's put us at uh, risk in so many ways and yet you open your arms to him and I think as a father, it speaks volumes to what true love and, and parenting is all about. And I like to think of our own God as feeling the same way about us as we make bad decisions, that there's always a home to come to with open arms. As a parent, it's meaningful, but also as a Christian, it's something that I value deeply. Well, that's wonderful. You mentioned your family. Uh, I presume they take up some of your free time. What else do you like to do besides <laughs> spend time? <laughs> Well, we uh, have a very busy young dog who um, keeps us happy and also frustrated. But uh, uh, we have a little Airedale, not a so little Airedale Terrier who we all adore. Um, I spend a lot of time in the garden as much as I can. Uh, I love gardening. I wish I could do more of it. Um, I don't want to say I look forward to my retirement, but I've already planned how I'm spending my time. And that's an important thing. We do love to travel. Um, I love... I do love camping. Um, when I was younger, I never thought I would, but this is something that has become a very important part of our family dynamic. Um, and our favorite type of camping is the camping where we're, we're traveling and seeing mm -hmm. uh, our country as we go and stopping in one glorious park after the other. Um, so if I wasn't doing music uh, and I wasn't uh, spending time doing the, the parent thing, I guess you could find me in the garden or, or, uh, or relaxing in the camp. Uh, site somewhere. Sounds wonderful. And if you were relaxing on a campsite, what would be your favorite flavor of ice cream to be enjoying? Well, um, unfortunately, I can't get this ice cream that is my favorite. Um, it's Chunky Monkey Ice Cream by Ben and Jerry's. Okay. 
Um, the only place that I've seen it is in uh, Southwest Florida, where we, I vacationed all throughout my childhood and into the adult life. My kids have gone with us, and there's a 7-Eleven a few doors down from the condo, and they sell, sell this Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey ice cream, and it's banana ice cream with chocolate chunks and pecans. Mm. Or is it walnuts? I think it's walnuts. Anyhow, this ice cream, if I had one last wish, it would be to have a quart of this ice cream that I didn't have to share with anyone. <laughs> But well, you can't find it up here. Maybe one day you'll get your wish. Maybe someone will find it. <laughs> That's right. Let you know. <laughs> That's right. Let me know. Well, Greg, I've enjoyed this very much. Thanks very much for our fireside chat. My pleasure. It's wonderful. Thank you. And we will look forward to having another one soon. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.